looks like almost everyone's connected to audio, which is awesome. So thank you all so much for being here. Welcome. Uh, my name is Emily Newberger. I am the Employer Relations Manager in the Block Career Center at UMKC. And today we have our uh, Exploring Careers panel in government, or sorry, excuse me, nonprofit, government, and NGO, non-governmental organizations. Um, and we have a great group of panelists here today. I'm very excited to welcome them. Um, so we'll, just a couple uh, logistical things for you all. If you have questions, please post them in the chat. Uh, for the time being, or ask me if you want to come off mute. Uh, I will gladly unmute you and you can come off mute and ask your question. You can also raise your hand and we'll unmute you that way if you do have a question for our panelists. Um, but I definitely just want to start off with a round of introductions. So um, Heidi, you're on my screen first, so and then I'll call on each of our panelists, but if you could just share your name, um, the title of your position, and the company that you work for, where you're located, um, just if you want to share anything about your educational background and then super short overview of what you do um, and maybe how long you've been doing it. Uh, well, I'm excited to be here today. My name is Heidi Holiday, and I am the executive director at Consensus KC. Uh, I've been there about three years this month, and we are a nonprofit organization that works to engage the public for the public good. Uh, my educational background is in uh, global peace and justice studies, originally in conflict management uh, with my undergrad degree. And then I actually graduated from the Block School of Management with an emphasis in nonprofit management in 2016. And I've been working in the nonprofit field for the past 15 years, basically since I graduated college. So excited to be here. Melissa, I would love to have you go next. Thank you. My name is Melissa Birchell, and I work for Girl Scouts of Northeast Kansas, Northwest Missouri. There are about 100 Girl Scout councils across the country, and so our council serves the greater, greater, greater KC metro area. Um, so we go all the way out to Topeka and up to Iowa. Sorry, Melissa, I accidentally un unmuted you. Can you unmute? There we go. Sorry. Oh. No, I could, my mouse just got away from me. <laughs> no worries. Do I need to start at the beginning? Uh, no, I think we we're just talking about you. There's 100 chapters, I think. Yeah. Great. There's 100 Girl Scout Councils. We are one of them. Uh, I am the Director of Information Systems and Business Processes, also in charge of our data and our reporting. I am a 13-year veteran of the nonprofit sector, and I've been at Girl Scouts for about seven years. Uh, my education background is I have a bachelor's in international relations. I also uh, obtained a certificate in nonprofit management at that time, and everything else has been self-taught, mostly technical learning. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Eric, we'll have you go next, please. Hey everybody, uh, good afternoon, I guess now. Uh, my name is Eric Gibbs and I work for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, I work for, at our regional office, which is located in uh, Lenox, Kansas. Uh, we have a four state region that we cover, uh, which is Kansas, Missouri, Iowa, and Nebraska. And our headquarters is uh, obviously in Washington, D.C. Um, my position, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a branch chief. Uh, so like a first line manager in the organization. Um, I manage a, a group within our mission support division. Uh, my particular group handles um, everything related to security, uh, real estate, facilities management, safety and health compliance. Uh, we've got fleet management, uh, real estate transactions, um, some of those types of things. So basically, I, we look at ourselves as kind of a customer service organization for the rest of EPA. So uh, there's obviously a lot of scientists the work for the agency, uh, law enforcement, things like that. Uh, we provide the critical um, mission critical support services that those folks need to go out and, and do their job in the field every day. Uh, my educational background, I've got a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration from the University of Central Missouri. And I've got an MBA with emphasis in finance and real estate from the Block School at uh, UMKC. And I have worked for the EPA, it'll be six years next month I've been at the EPA, and I've been with the federal government for about 21 years. Thanks. Yeah, wonderful, thank you. We love to have alum here as well. 
Um, and then last, but certainly not least, uh, Katie, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, hi everyone. Good afternoon. Thanks for spending your lunch hour with us. My name is Katie Lord. I work at a company called Proof Positioning, and I head up our nonprofit side of that business. Um, we're a market research firm, and we focus on kind of emotional intelligence and psychology and behavioral economics. And um, let's see, I've been working on in or for the nonprofit sector going on 14 years now. And I have a bachelor's degree in psychology and communications from KU and have, um, much like Melissa said, there's a lot of on the job um, training that you do in the nonprofit sector, a lot of self-taught, um, but also I've taken a lot of different classes and have some certificates as well in the sector on some sector specific things. I've been here at Proof um, for two years, just recently celebrated my second year um, here. So thank you for so much for having me. And I'm excited to be on the panel with everyone. Yeah, and we're excited to have you here. Thank, and thank you all again to our panelists. Um, I did just wanna let all of our audience members know that we are recording this and we'll post it to our YouTube page. So if you do have to jump, jump off for whatever reason or need to um, wanna review the, the panel, you can, you'll be able to do that. So um, great. Uh, so just my first question for all of you, and again, to our audience, please post your questions in the chat. Um, like I said, or I can unmute you all. Um, but just talking about like how you kind of got to where you are in your current role and um, yeah, working in the nonprofit slash government area. So um, Katie, we'll go ahead and start with you and just kind of work our way backwards. Okay, so how did I get started in the nonprofit sector? Well, um, I did not go to college thinking I wanted to be in the nonprofit sector. Uh, it was something that I kind of fell into, to be quite honest with you, that I discovered while I was a student doing a lot of volunteer projects and working a lot with fundraisers and for both my sorority and then also just outside of that, I was very connected into the community. And so um, I, I really discovered it because to be very honest with you, someone took a chance on me. I didn't have a lot of nonprofit experience, but I was hired on after um, college as a entry level fundraiser with the American Cancer Society. And then after that, I, I spent four years at American Cancer Society and then spent uh, um, a couple other years with the Make-A-Wish Foundation and Leukemia Lymphoma Society. After that, I knew I wanted to continue to grow within the sector and I went over to the nonprofit consulting side. So I worked for a capital campaign firm here in Kansas City, did that for four years. And then this opportunity at Proof came open and it was to come and really build out the nonprofit side of business. So working with nonprofit partners and growing and expanding that. What I would say is a lot of it has to do, a lot of my career, has been a lot of saying yes to things that I didn't think I could do or just listening to opportunities that come up. My dad, I, I call them dadisms. My dad's like the wisest person I know. Um, and he said, you know, talk is cheap and listening is for free. So go and listen to what people have to say here. You're not committing to anything, but always keep open opportunities. And that is how I've ended up at Proof because if you would have asked me four or five years ago, if I'd be doing what I I'm doing today, I would have laughed at you and said that that's impossible. I don't, I don't even like data that much, but now I love it and I live it. So, um, so that's kind of how I got into the sector. And, um, you know, I will always say there is a team of people that helps everyone. I, what I love about our sector is I think we are the most generous and giving sector as far as time and mentorship. And I have very much benefited from mentorship and sponsorship in this field. Thank you. I love that um, dadism, if you will. I have some of my own as well from my own uh, father, but yeah, so funny. So, all right. Um, Eric, if you want to go ahead and let us know your career path and trajectory and maybe just a little bit more about what you do too. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and thanks for having me. I didn't get a chance to say that earlier. I forgot about that, but I, this is this is pretty cool. So I welcome to everybody and all the students uh, calling in for this. It's a, it's a great opportunity and, and uh, I'm looking back, it would have been Nice if I'd had something like this, but this is pretty neat. So what's kind of cool that I think is I've got a lot of similarities to some of the things that Katie said, even though it sounds like our jobs are probably quite a bit different. Um, this, you know, keep an open mind, look for opportunities, don't say no, um, say yes to pretty much anything that comes your way because you never know what can happen. Um, specifically for me, so how, so how did I get, you know, I didn't, when I was in college, I 
didn't expect to, um, to be working for the government at all. Um, I actually went into college as a music education major my freshman year um, and uh, changed majors a few times in college, um, but uh, ended up with a business degree. And what happened, I, I registered with my, I was at University of Central Missouri in Warrensburg for undergrad, uh, registered with the career services offices, the office there. And because I registered with that, um, you know, I, I would start getting letters from employers uh, about different opportunities. And I got one from a government agency called the General Services Administration, GSA. And it was for an internship, a paid internship um, for a college, a recent college graduate uh, to come in and learn about um, government real estate. And so I thought it sounded cool. I interviewed, I got the job. And that's how I started right out of school uh, with GSA. And I was there for 15 years. I, wanted to, I probably had five or six different jobs in that 15 year period. Um, and then an, this opportunity at EPA came up a few years ago and I took that. So um, to make a really long story, really, really short, that's, that's basically how it happened. But um, the, the reason I got to where I am was, you know, one, register with the Career Services Office. Um, there was lots of things. Most, a lot of stuff I got I wasn't interested in, but, um, you know, at least I was getting, getting things and, and getting notified of things and stuff like that. The other thing that they offered that I thought was valuable at that time was mock interviews, um, which helped me tremendously as I started going out and interviewing for, you know, quote, real world jobs. Um, you know, I had my jobs in college uh, that were my college jobs, which were fine. But when you're interviewing for a large organization or something like that, it's 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 a different it's a different ball game. So uh, anyway, I'm I'm a huge fan of career services, um, and uh, like I say, just just say yes to opportunities that come your way. Keep an open mind and, and don't be afraid to try new things. Wonderful. We love uh, cheerleaders for career services, and yes, to our students, we're always here to help you and help you land that job or find a career path, whatever it may be. So we appreciate um, someone who's been through that and can speak to how great it is. So great. Uh, Melissa, please give us your kind of backstory, if you will. Sure. I uh, really got into the nonprofit sector through internships. Um, and I, I saw a question come through the log about networking and going mm -hmm. to events like that. Um, I cannot speak for other panelists, but I have never met anybody at an event like that that ever advanced my career. Um, I've only ever gotten improvements through leveraged connections with people who have seen the quality of my work or my um, attention to detail or my ability to work with volunteers. Um, and so I make sure that I'm in positions where um, people can see that. Um, so like when I, I knew I wanted to work um, for Girl Scouts, I volunteered for Girl Scouts. I volunteered for a lot of different staff members there. And I was willing to do the sort of work that other volunteers didn't want to, like high emotional labor work, like being a greeter at something or running a check-in table um, or um, sitting at a table um, maybe with some volunteers that are a little difficult and kind of being like the, the pump it up man at the table. Um, so putting myself in roles that look like staff roles um, so that they could see I was really good and that I was a good contributor to things. So by doing that, I made connections with not just people I had met, but people who trusted me and thought I would be a good team member with them. And the benefit of that is like, you also like just meet a lot of cool people and you enjoy your coworkers because you're, you're already used to being on a team with a lot of them. So um, that's kind of how I work. I just kind of roll to whatever's interesting and get to know that place first um, before I apply there. Um, and then I would absolutely um, echo what Katie said and that one of my keys to success is being flexible. Um, it, ch it changes are here all the time. Nonprofit sector is always changing. And if you're willing to say yes, you'll find yourself in opportunities um, that you never dreamed of being in, but that are so cool when you get there. Love hearing, you know, just reiterating, do your research, get involved if you can, um, and leverage that piece of it. So great. Thank you. Uh, and finally, Heidi, please. 
can share. Are we having maybe a little issue coming off mute? Let me ask you to unmute. There we go. Perfect. Yes. There we go. Yeah, so I I will also echo some of what's been said. Um, my career path is I I always knew I wanted to go into nonprofits. So when I was in fourth grade, I was part of this advocacy effort to make the barred tiger salamander the state reptile or state amphibian of Kansas. And I was like, oh my god, this is so cool. Um, I want to do this for forever. At, at first, I wanted to be astronaut and president, and then I realized my eyesight was too bad to be an astronaut. And president was probably unlikely. So then I was like, all right, nonprofit sector. So I set a goal for myself um, at some point during college that I wanted to be a nonprofit executive director by the age of 30. I had no idea how I was going to get there. Um, and I just started saying yes, as others have said. So I started out working as a community organizer when I was in college down in the Wichita area. Um, I spent a year doing that. That's hard work. That's going door to door. It's meeting people. Um, it, it's hearing heartbreaking stories and, and working to mobilize groups for action. Uh, when I got out of college and, and moved up towards the Kansas City area, I uh, got a job at Rosedale Development Association, which is a small community development organization on the Kansas City, Kansas side. And I started out there kind of doing the same thing. Um, I was a program director, but I was also doing a lot of community organizing work still. And one of the things that I think really advanced my career was embracing mentorship opportunities from people within the organization. So um, when our executive director decided to retire, she approached me and asked if I would be interested in applying for the position. And I was like, well, I mean, yes, but I'm also terrified of that. Like, I, I don't know if I could do it. Um, and she really advocated for me and she was a fantastic mentor. And I achieved my career goal, which was I became executive director at the age of 28 and kind of took that on. I was there for four years and then I went to Topeka. I really, I still have this advocacy bug that I wanted to explore. So I um, took a position as executive director of a state budget and policy organization that gave advocacy in the Kansas State House. Um, so I was working in Topeka for two years over in the state house daily working with lawmakers and lobbyists and the governor's office, well, not the governor's office because at the time it was uh, Governor Brown back and he was not in favor of the work that we were doing, but with lawmakers and with lobbyists and other nonprofit organizations. I spent two years in Topeka and um, during that time I had my first kid and I realized that I did not want to be commuting an hour each way. And I needed to figure out childcare options that worked with a nonprofit career. And I wanted to do some more work that was um, centered on community engagement, kind of getting back to my roots of community engagement, community organizing work. So the position opened up at Consensus KC, and I had actually, speaking of mentors, had on my list in August of that year that I really wanted to reach out to the, the former executive director to talk to her about being a mentor as I went into this space. I was thinking about doing consulting work or something else. And then literally the following week, her job opened up and I applied and got accepted. So this is my third gig as executive director of three different, very different nonprofit organizations. Um, and I've learned a lot, but I think really looking for mentors within the organization, saying yes, even when you think that you're not up to the job, and then also recognizing when you need to make a change for your own um, for your own health, for your own family, for your own um, sanity. I think that that's an, another very important thing that I am recognizing we need to talk about more and more in the nonprofit sector. Yeah, for sure, that work-life balance. And that kind of actually segues really well into my next question, because I'm just waiting for questions from our students. So please, like I said, post in the chat or ask me to come off mute. Um, but I was going to ask what is um, maybe like one thing that is uh, challenging about the work that you do or maybe something that you would change. And um, yeah, just kind of segueing into that, because I think it's good for students to see, to know, to understand maybe what some challenges are going into the, the industries, but, you know, also balancing it out with positives, right? So, yeah. Um, great. Uh, Melissa, would you like to go first? Or if you need some more time to think about this question too, you can also let me know that. Sure. 
I think a really neat thing about the sector is uh, they, you can't always get compensation in the form of the money you want, but uh, there can be other forms of compensation. Um, and so like at our organization, being able to have a flexible schedule, um, being able to work remotely, um, those are other forms of compensation that are very valuable to me. So I think when you're um, looking at starting a new position or being in a current one and sort of negotiating what you need, those are forms of compensation that they can offer or that you can request um, in order to retain you um, as a talented nonprofit professional. That's great. I love hearing that. Um, Katie, would you like to go next? Yeah, so I would say, you know, in what I'm doing right now, what is difficult about our job is sometimes when there's something new, the sector is a little bit slower to adopt than maybe the business side of, um, uh, of an organization. So I would just say sometimes our slow adoption can be a little frustrating in the nonprofit sector, but I would also, you know, counterbalance that to say that um, kind of exactly what um, Melissa just said, but I have negotiated every single one of my my packages um, since the, since my first job, and so I think that um, always negotiating and asking for what you want is important. The most you'll hear is no, we're not right now, and um, and that's okay. But you have to be your best advocate. So that would be something that I that I would say um, I've, it has been a skill that I've learned. It's very uncomfortable, um, but it's something that, uh, especially if you're going to be in the nonprofit sector, you're going to be asking a lot. So you might as well get really used to it and get used to hearing no. And that's okay because um, every time you hear a no, you're closer to a yes. So those would be kind of maybe the two things that I don't, that can make your, your job a little bit harder in, in the nonprofit sector. That's great. And we have career coaches that will help you with those negotiation conversations and sort of learning that skill. So uh, please reach out to us. Um, Heidi, we'll have you go next and then Eric, have you wrap us up on this question. This might be because I've been applying for grants and seeking out funding for our organization for next year this week. But um, I think one of the most difficult things in my mind about the nonprofit sector is that there's always this chicken and egg of like following the money um, versus doing the work that we know needs to be done. And sometimes that, you know, can be this uncomfortable conversation of like trying to figure out how to fund the really vital work that we do. Um, I can speak from the perspective of consensus and from the organizations that I have done work with direct advocacy. It can be difficult to find funding to fund that work. So. For example, consensus does deep community engagement on issues of public importance. Um, that can be anything from like vaccine hesitancy to um, uh, going back to work and the economy to voting rights and legislation. So we, we explore all of these very different topics. But the problem is that like a lot of times foundations want to fund a specific topic and then a whole lot of things underneath that. And so for organizations that are doing kind of more a broad exploration or things like that, just the, the funding constraints um, as an executive director can be really, really um, frustrating. And it, it's also, it can be um, difficult to pay your employees what you know they're worth. It can be difficult to make sure that you are setting up the kind of organization that takes care of your staff and takes care of your volunteers. Um, I mean, there are definitely creative ways to do it, but I, I feel like I wish that there was, there were some different ways to, to fund the work that we do that were more open-ended and that weren't so um, narrowly defined by foundations. Um, and I know that there are innovations going on around this in like the, the for good sector and uh, B corporations and social enterprise and whatnot. Um, but I think that that is a frustration that I have. And I would echo the things about advocating for yourself always definitely. I think um, that, is, that is something that you should definitely do and use career services for help with that. Yes, thank you. I appreciate your kind of honesty there and knowing that hopefully it will 
like you said, just that funding options will continue to just be more flexible. Yeah. Um, great. Eric, go for it. Yeah, thanks. So um, a couple of things, actually echoing something that Heidi just said, advocating for yourself. Um, you know, I mentioned if you got the opportunity while you're still in school, if you're a recent graduate also to do mock interviews or something like that, but also, um, you know, any kind of like, as a, you know, before you get to an interview, you got you to have a good resume, right? So any kind of, um, you know, assistance or um, uh, proofreading or, or whatever that you can get on, on resume writing uh, can be super helpful. And one thing that was hard for me to learn you know, was that you work on a project, you know, either in class or at a, at a job or something. Don't sell yourself short on that. Make sure you take, you know, you, you dig in and, and figure out what the aspects of that project were that an employer could be looking for, um, you know, whether it's skills and, you know, financial ability or, you know, other type of business acumen things, um, different, different things. So think about it critically, you know, with what classes you've taken and what the requirements of the job might be. And, um, you know, do, do, try to try to put it in your resume in a way that makes sense for an employer and it translates to, to skills that could go right into that job. Uh, so many times I see where somebody's like, yeah, I did a project in this. And I'm like, well, that's fantastic. But but what skills did you have to do? And what was your or, and the other thing that I see, too, um, especially from um, some of the more recent graduates uh, as I'm hiring is I was on a team and the team did this. That's awesome. What was your role on the team? What did you do? And what did you do to help get results for that? So it's all, it's great to be on teams. There's nothing wrong with being on teams. It's, it's great to be on teams, but you need to be able to articulate very, very, very well your specific role on that team and how your role um, helped to achieve a particular result. Um, that's something that I think um, a lot of people are, are, are really missing right now, just to be frank. Um, and, and it really stands out. When somebody comes in and says, I was on a team and here's my role, it, it stands out unbelievably. You, um, it, it, it's massive. So I would encourage everybody to think about stuff like that. Um, the other thing specific to um, like federal government, one of the biggest questions I ask is how to find out about jobs, how to know if I'm eligible for particular jobs, how to, how to sort of get in. It, it, the biggest challenge with getting a job for the federal government is just, just being eligible and getting in. Um, it's not easy, especially if you're not a veteran. Um, there's less programs to, for, for those who are non-vets to, to get in to the federal government uh, on the civilian side. But what I wanted to mention to you guys is if you're currently in school, um, you're eligible for a lot of internships. Um, a good chunk of those are paid internships with, with different federal agencies. The other thing, if you've recently graduated, there's something that the entire federal government uses called the Recent Graduate Program. And within two years after your graduation date, uh, you've got some extra eligibility on different things too. So um, if, you're, if you are particularly interested in federal government, I would, I would highly suggest you check out um, a website called usajobs.gov. It's the central website that all civilian agencies and defense agencies too, they post all their jobs on that website. Um, the other thing is if you're interested in a particular agency with the federal government, hit up their website and go to the careers section. A lot of times there's an HR point of contact there that you can reach out to, send an email or do a phone call and find out. Um, but um, the, the biggest thing you take advantage of, like I say, right now as a current student would be internships. And if you're within two years of your graduation, those recent graduate programs are excellent. I just hired somebody um, last month on the recent graduate program, and he's off to a, a fantastic start. Um, and if he would have waited more than two years to put in, he wouldn't have even been able, he wouldn't have been on my my certification was from HR. So just a, just a couple of things to think about. Great, thank you so much. So Emily had to drop off for just a sec because her Zoom froze, but she'll be right back. Uh, was there any other panelists you wanted to touch a little bit more on that point that Eric made? About just, I guess, general advice for that networking piece and job searching? Yeah, I mean, so what I would say is, um, so I think networking is incredibly important. Um, I think especially right when you get out of or are even in, I mean, I've spoken with a lot of college students, so I would say start early, start often. If you can say yes to everyone for a year, there will be times when I swear I'll be like, I don't know why this person set me up with this person. Like, I have no idea why we had this meeting. And then two years later, I'll be like, oh my gosh, I know that 
you know, I can connect them in, in a way. So, um, you know, go in with the mind of how can I be of service, not what can you get me, but, um, you really need to say yes to everything because you just never know. Kansas city is a big, small town, especially, but our sector is very small and, um, very tight. And I would say that, you know, the more you can just go out and have coffee and, and chat with people and learn things, the better off you are. So I would really try to build that into your day. I mean, I try to have, um, even with my day-to-day -day job, I try to have at least one coffee every day. That's just flat out networking. It's not any sort of other conversation. I know not everyone can do that, but, um, you know, try, try to do that, make connections, use your LinkedIn. Somebody said something about LinkedIn and I was like, yes, um, I use LinkedIn all the time, especially during the pandemic. When I was trapped at home, what I did is I just reached out to people that I admired or followed and had some great conversations. And then later on, it's turned to business, which was not the actual intention at all. It was just to get to know. And I was like, hey, I love your content, or this is cool, or tell me about what you're doing. And um, so, you know, be curious, be open. And I think it, it's super important to um, connect with people, but also a little bit um, just to, to tag on to what Eric said too, you know, you have to be your own advocate. It's great to have people that are advocates for you, but you need to be your own advocate. And then also there's a lot of free, free ways to continue learning. Like I'm reading a nonprofit book all the time. There's a lot of great podcasts and things. So, you know, pick what you're interested in, like, and continue to, to strive and, and push yourself to be better and then connect with those people. Um, because most, again, I've reached out to a lot of random people and it's worked out that we've had great conversations. So um, really just, you know, be open and continue to push. Don't, um, once you once you graduate, continue to um, be curious and, and, and to um, have your love for the field if you can. I love that. Heidi, you asked, or you look like you had a, something to add there. <laughs> Yeah, if I can just briefly add on to what Katie said, I, I completely agree about networking, go to as many events, get coffee, talk to folks. Um, also, the Nonprofit Connect job board is really helpful for finding jobs within the nonprofit field. And then I know that UNKC has had in the past a um, board, like a board matching thing. And if you can get board service under your belt, if you are trying to get into the nonprofit sector, um, oftentimes, nonprofits are trying to look for young people to join boards. Our boards tend to be older. Um, and so we are often looking for the voices of youth to join our boards. So if there is an organization or a field that you are really interested in, you might look at what board service opportunities are out there. And as Melissa was mentioning, volunteer opportunities as well. Um, because those are great ways to just get your name out there and start networking with folks, even if it ends up that you don't work there. You, you will meet other people. It is a big, small town. Excellent. So I was gonna point out that I'm not super aware if there's any like service now or, or program even that matches students with like boards, but I will say, and, and just echo your advice, Heidi, that like if, if you as a student have an interest, use Nonprofit Connect to connect with those nonprofits uh, and and ask how you can get involved. Uh, so many of these uh, nonprofits have those volunteer opportunities and allow you to do that, not just even at a board level. Of course, obviously, Heidi mentioned that that's an option, um, but just don't be afraid to necessarily um, put yourself out there. I know uh, something that I get a lot um, uh, from students is just that intimidation factor that they are really afraid to reach out to people and and really afraid to make that connection so i'm really glad that all of you are saying don't be afraid and <laughs> do that uh, make that step um, because you never really know how that's going to to last or how or really come out it looks like laura even mentions uh the board connection is through the midwest center for nonprofit leadership so thank you laura i did not know that that is a good thing for me to know too. So I'm actually even jotting that down uh, as well. So it looks like Emily's back. Emily, are you able to take over again? Yes, Hi. thank you so much, Ashley. So sorry, I couldn't, you all were just like little white squares and I couldn't see anything. So um, yeah, always happens, seems to happen. So um, yeah, and I appreciate that Ashley's uh, questions and things like that. Um, I guess and it, this seems to be like a running theme I also want to make sure we get 
I guess I was going to say, but I think the running thing that we've talked about is just like the networking piece. And um, you've all been giving like a lot of advice to students, which is really great. Um, I'm just trying to see if we've gotten to all the questions in the chat. Just make sure. Let's see. If there's another one. I think one that wasn't necessarily explicitly addressed, but Eric uh, chimed in through the chat was just uh, from Jason Foster. Just advice for mid-career professionals if they're. Yes, that would be awesome. And I know another student asked you just about different. Um, I don't know if you all are like the hiring managers for any open jobs or internships, but if there are ways to get involved with your organizations, uh, what those might be, I think that would be helpful to our students. So um, I'll just, Katie, if you want to start with, with that. So I'm not the hiring manager, um, but you know what I would say, so for mid-career, just like anything, I think going in um, humble and willing to learn I, I loved what Eric said about identifying new people to talk to. Um, I think something to just be careful about just because of working in the sector is um, saying things like, which I've heard, which, which is like, oh, well, I'm just going to like retire in the nonprofit sector or I'm going to, you know, take it easy and just go to the nonprofit sector. It's like, oh, yeah, you're going to work really hard in the nonprofit sector. So go in with... Um, um, sometimes I, I, you know, go in with, I guess, respect for that there, even though it's a different, it could be a different skill set. There's a lot of business minded in the nonprofit, but there are nuances to it. So go in knowing how your skills can translate, talk about how your skills can translate. Um, but also go in, go in knowing that you will, you know, you're going to go into a new sector. So there's going to be a little bit of a learning curve and that's okay, but, but focus a lot on your strengths. Um, as far as AmeriCorps, I have great respect and have worked with a lot of nonprofits and in a lot of nonprofits that have used AmeriCorps. So I have seen um, Vista work and then a lot of people that have been in Vista turn into full-time positions later on at other nonprofits. So um, that's, you know, the little bit that I've um, known about with, with the VIS, with the VISTA program, but I don't know a lot more than that. And then if you can, as people have said, internships, internships, and volunteer, just get out there, volunteer, the more you can see, touch, and feel the type of work, um, do it because that's, that, that was how my first boss hired me is because of all my volunteer work, um, not because of any particular other skill set. Melissa, do you have anything you want to add? Yes. Um, I also saw the question about um, AmeriCorps and um, in terms of whenever you're talking to a hiring manager, uh, the hiring manager doesn't really care, well, at least at our organization, is not going to look at your educational credentials or, oh, this was an AmeriCorps person or, oh, they held this position at a job, what they want to know is how does all of that translate? So I would say um, I have worked with AmeriCorps programs before, so I have a good um, understanding of it and I think it's great, um, but I would be looking for you to sell it to me um, and don't make me do the math. You tell me what you did in AmeriCorps that's going to help you tell me what you learned um, in whatever education you have that is going to help you. Um, so definitely, you don't just like drop it and run. You want to drop it and help that hiring manager unpack why those experiences make you good for this position. Um, and specifically, like if you come to us, uh, Girl Scouts, um, and you say, I am amazing at nonprofit management. I have all of these wonderful educational credentials. Be like, great, we have like three people here who do true management. Everybody else is doing specialized things. So you're applying for this job. You need to talk to me about volunteer management. We don't care about that other stuff. You need to focus on what precisely that job is going to need. And otherwise, I don't, it doesn't matter to me what else you have going on. Awesome. Um... Eric, do you, are you involved in like the hiring process at the EPA or do you have any internships, ways for students to get involved so they can start getting some experience? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I've done a fair amount of hiring. And uh, the one thing like Melissa, I, Melissa made a really good point. Like, um, you know, you, you need to, to make sure your skills translate to what the organization is looking for. 
but in order to do that, you got to do your homework. You got to, you got to understand what they're looking for and, and know, um, you know, what's going to be valuable to them. And uh, like I said a little bit ago, try to figure out a way to translate your skills that you've done on past projects to, uh, to what they're looking for there. So um, I posted a website in the chat. Um, it's, it's a huge, big, massive website with a bazillion different things on there. Uh, it can be a little intimidating, but the, the searching on it is actually really, really good. Um, and you can set it up to even send you like email notifications if something with your preferences um, pops up. But again, like if you, if you have a specific interest in a particular federal agency, I would highly recommend at least hitting up their website. Um, the one really cool thing about, you know, Kansas City um, is a pretty small city in the grand scheme of larger cities. It's, it's a really small city. Uh, but in the federal community, um, it's got a lot. Um, it's, so there's, there's 10, quote, federal cities that have been identified, I think it's back in the 40s when the government was doing some strategic stuff that, and Kansas city was identified as a federal city. So one thing that we have um, very similar to other cities like New York, Boston, Chicago, San Francisco, these really big cities, there's a regional office here for nearly every civilian agency. I think there's over 40 different civilian agencies represented in Kansas city. So if you're interested in a job at the federal government, um, it, there's a really, really good chance there's going to be something here in town for you and hiring is starting to pick up a lot. So I would encourage you to reach out, you know, to the particular agency you're looking for, find out where their, their regional office is here in the Kansas City area and try to get a hold of a contact there, um, whether it's for a particular program area or even HR or something like that. And uh, these people are happy to talk to you. I mean, it's, it's, there's nothing better than, than getting a phone call or an email from somebody that says, hey, I'm interested in what you do or what your agency does. And I'd like to find a way to see if there's an opportunity for me. Um, you know, sometimes, like I said earlier, the challenge can be getting a job, but, but it's, it's, it is, it's always cool to get a call or an email from somebody like that. And people, are, people in general are very, very happy to, to take those inquiries. So don't hesitate to reach out and, um, and do a little homework and, and uh, don't be shy. Great, appreciate that. Um, Heidi, also same question to you. Any ways for students to get involved in your, or like if you're involved in hiring for your organization specifically, or if there's volunteer opportunities so students can start getting that experience? We are pretty tiny. Um, I'm a one person shop at Consensus KC, but we do have board openings right now. So I mentioned that earlier. Um, there are board openings right now. If I think it's on the website, if it's not, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or via email and I can send you the application. Um, we also are always looking for volunteers to help us facilitate community conversations. And we have a number of upcoming events. Um, so we host a, a weekly Zoom chat, which will take place next Thursday over the noon hour. Um, and we uh, we haven't decided what topic we'll be doing, but there's all sorts of options for connecting with us um, online right now through our community events. And then, uh, yeah, we don't have any job openings right now, unfortunately, but we work with a lot of other organizations as well. So if you start volunteering with us and facilitating with us, if we hear something that might be up your alley, we'd, you know, definitely provide references or whatnot if, if that was I uh, if that made sense awesome yes and we will be sharing um all the panelists their email addresses and you can connect with them on linkedin they've all agreed to that as well um, and one thing i'm curious about is more talking about like your day-to-day -day work life um so i know probably there's no day looks the same for you all um as most jobs but uh, either if you could talk about that or if there's been like a favorite project that you've worked on either recently or um, in the past, that would be something that I think our students could help them sort of visualize what a career in nonprofit or government could look like. So, um, Katie, I think I saw you react to this so question. Excited. So I'll, I'll uh, have you, yeah, go first. I was just thinking, I was like, oh my gosh, um, every day is different. And that's what I love about the nonprofit sector. Like for a lot of us, it's we're meeting with potential supporters or clients or business executives. So every day can can truly be different. So, I mean, 
I start my day with coffee. I can end my day at a nonprofit connect event or another event. I can be working with different clients. Um, right now I work with a lot of different clients. So one of my favorite things is I'm touching multiple, multiple missions. And so it's really, um, that's what I would say I love is for most, most of the time, especially in um, fundraising and, you know, being an executive director is you're jumping from task to task and from things to things. You can be looking at budgets and other skills and, um, and really spreading yourself. So even if there's one thing that you don't like, you'll be switching to something else and, and working on a lot of different projects. So that's what I would say. I just absolutely um, love about the sector. You know, a project that we're working with right now is there's um, a local organization that we're working with that has a um, pay what you can cafe. So you, some of you might know it, but I'm, I'm going to just leave it there. But we're working with them right now um, to help find out, you know, how does their business help their nonprofit, but then also um, how are they the same? How are they different? And how does that earned revenue, you know, affect um, their, their business? And um, it's, it's fascinating to, to see how things are um, looking. So, uh, so that's one of my favorite projects that I've been working on right now. That's great. Um... Eric, do you want to talk about what your day-to-day -day work life is like? Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I agree that the same thing here. It's it's different every day. There's a lot of variety. And, um, you know, specifically um, at the EPA, a lot of times we're sort of reacting to things that are going on in the world as well. Um, many times, uh, you know, we'll, we will respond to natural disasters like hurricanes, wildfires, things like that. Um, Part of it, you know, so the EPA's mission is to protect human health and the environment. Uh, part of the response will have to do with um, helping people, you know, on the ground. For example, you know, hurricanes, a lot of time, uh, and actually over the last few years, um, Texas and, and uh, Louisiana have gotten hit especially hard. Uh, we had a huge response a few years ago to Hurricane Harvey. Uh, it's probably the biggest response we had since I've been working for the EPA. And, you know, a lot of the, uh, what, one big reason that we go down there is because it's because of the flooding, um, you know, manufacturing facilities will flood, which can release all kinds of nasty stuff into the waters and, and that ends up in rivers and streams and in people's backyards um, in those cases. So we'll spend people down there for that. But the other thing is we have community outreach functions where uh, we will actually send people out knocking door to door to make sure people are okay. Uh, we've helped evacuate people with some of our um, you know, boats and, and different resources that we have. Um, similar, similar uh, efforts with responses to the wildfires out west. Um, you know, fortunately, this part of the country here where we are at has not gotten hit by huge tornadoes or floods recently. Uh, but when they do, we do the same type of stuff here right here at home uh, with, with Missouri River flooding. Iowa has flooded in the last few years uh, more than some of the other areas. We send people up there to make sure things are okay. And uh, like I said, nasty stuff's not getting into the water system, that kind of a thing. Um, and it's, it's kind of neat to know that you're helping out with all that and that there's, that you have a direct effort, no matter what you're, you know, particularly in my job, um, people will need uh, resources to, to go up and do that. So we will provide vehicles, we'll provide boats, uh, we will provide safety gear uh, for the folks who are out there, you know, tromping through this stuff. Um, different resources, train, even training. Uh, if somebody needs to know how to do something, uh, we, will, we will go out and, and make sure that they've trained and they, they know what they're doing um, from a safety and health standpoint. So that's the coolest part for me is seeing these things that happen and knowing that what I'm doing is, um, is helping, helping to, to make a difference hopefully in, in some of this. And, and uh, you know, every federal agency has their own mission but uh, I've worked with a lot of them over the years and, and they all have the same people who are looking forward to, to helping out with whatever their particular agency does. So, you know, I, I would say, um, you know, if you're looking for something, you know, try to identify what's important to you as far as values and how you like to help people um, or get, get a job done and seek out organizations that do that particular thing. It's gonna make your, it's gonna make every day at work much more enjoyable if you do something like that from the front end. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it's really cool to hear about some of the, the stuff you do. Uh, Heidi, how about you? I know you said you just submitted a, a grant right before you got on this panel, I believe. So. Yeah, that was my rush this morning. Um, yeah, I mean, every day is going to be different. Um, 
I think that the thing that I get really excited about doing is um, the bringing people together in conversation and community engagement work. I mean, that's kind of been a common thread throughout my career. And that's the part where I get like really excited. Um, I also have started going back to doing a few in-person uh, events and in-person coffees again. And it is refreshing um, to see people in person again. I think I was I was really missing that doing all of my work virtually. I mean, I've I have gotten really really good at Zoom and Zoom facilitation, but it's there's no replacing like the energy that you feel in a room. Um, so that is something that that really feeds me. Um, I think that honestly, during COVID, my like work hygiene in terms of like what hours I'm on and off the computer has really gotten terrible and I would assume that that's probably the same for a lot of the panelists. I was just typing a response to Catherine's question about flexibility and schedule. But I do try to to you know set aside certain days of the month or times during the week to do various things like um you know kind of being on a schedule for looking for grants or for funding, kind of being on a schedule for what when our communications go out, when our social media posts go out. Um, we have more of like an annual calendar, and then we work with a lot of nonprofit partners and corporate partners at times to, to sponsor events um, or to host things or to provide facilitation for that. So it, it's so dependable um, on what's, what's happening at the time. But I think there are, you know, specific things that happen on a regular basis. Um, a lot of that has gone out the window, to be honest, the past 18 months. <laughs> and I, I'm sure the other panelists feel that as well. Yeah, I know. Our, I think everyone's screen time has doubled or tripled um, in the past year and a half or so. So um, great. Thank you. And then Melissa, yeah, what's your day to day life like or a cool project that you or a project that you've liked working on? Sure. Uh, a lot of my job is uh, creating connections or improving relationships uh, between departments and teams um, in our organization. So I am not customer facing in my day-to-day -day role. Um, and so that means I um, provide leadership without uh, um, actual like uh, accountability for these people. So it takes a lot of soft skills to be able to say, well, let's think about um, maybe a better way that we could do this when I don't manage that person. <laughs> that person doesn't have to respond to me. Um, so I really have to do a lot of relationship building and listening and being fair um, and helping everyone organize what's going on as a team. Um, so that means I'm just always involved in a lot of different projects. Um, so it's different. It's a lot of plate spinning. Um, I would say, uh, it's not my favorite project, but probably the coolest project is um, about two years ago, um, my boss came to me and she's like, all right, so you're in charge of IT now. I'm like, cool, cool, cool. I don't know anything about IT. Um, so that's one of those saying yes moments. And uh, what that means is... Um, I learned like you don't have to know everything about something to be able to provide a value and leadership for that effort. And so I went out and I found some volunteers of ours who are really into that sector and very knowledgeable. I found other contacts, really understood um, what I needed to be doing, what my priorities were. Um, and uh, a year after that, we ended up implementing uh, Office 365, we had voice over IP phones, we got, um, we didn't have to use our servers anymore. And uh, then COVID happened. And um, I, I was telling like our CEO, so uh, we're fine, everybody can work remote. It's not a problem. We had accidentally like made ourselves uh, pandemic proof <laughs> just by following the advice of people who knew what they were doing. Um, so that, that was definitely one of those projects was like, oh, that, was, that worked out much, much better than I ever thought it would. Um, but it was definitely something where my initial thought was, I don't know how to do any of this. Yeah, no, that's great to kind of, yeah, I think we've, all of us professionals probably been there asked to do something. You have no idea how to do it, but then yeah, you have to figure it out. So 
I love hearing that you've now pandemic proofed your organization, which is awesome. Um, great. Uh, we just have about five minutes left. So I, uh, Catherine, uh, did ask a good question about like work-life balance. And that was my next question for you all. So I don't know if you want to each maybe elaborate on responses that you um, just gave in the chat and or if you want to give like one piece of advice, um, last piece of advice to our students, or you could give a piece of advice to your younger self. Sorry to unload a bunch of like questions on you, but I like to give panelists options to speak to something that resonates with them. So um, Katie, I see you unmuted yourself. So go for it. Um, so good, good career advice. I, I tend toward being a workaholic. I love my job. So I tend to work a lot. And I think that that's a slippery slope, especially in the nonprofit sector is because we um, all, you know, have a mission or something that we're really driven by. But another dadism is, you know, they don't put you worked, you were a great worker on your gravestone. So it is important to set your boundaries and to set them early, to, you know, to my, to my younger self, I would say, um, you know, I, I experienced a lot of, well, you don't have children, so you don't have a life, therefore, you know, do stuff. So now that I have a child, I try not to do that to other people. Um, but be clear about what your boundaries are. If you need to, you know, not be available from six to 730, then you need to just make sure that that's a clear boundary that you're setting early and you have that expectation and, you know, but also be flexible with, maybe that means you'll be, um, you know, getting on at 830 after your kiddo's in bed or something like that. So, you know, be, fle be flexible yourself, but also ask for what you need um, because people aren't mind readers. Um, but, but you do need to walk away and it's okay to walk away at times because self-care is huge. Burnout can be huge in this sector. So you have to start, you know, set that up from the beginning and don't try to backtrack it later. Yeah, go for it, Heidi. I see you. I, I want to build off of what Katie said, because I think that's so true. And I think so many of us in the nonprofit sector care so deeply about the work that we do. And we're so connected to like our life purpose is this, and I want to be a part of this at all the time. And we have such difficulty saying no, and then that leads to burnout and everything else. So my advice that I would have given my younger self is to find something that is completely unrelated to work that you are excited about and passionate about and force yourself on a daily, weekly basis to do that. So mine right now, and I've been terrible at doing it recently, but I took up the banjo two years ago um, just so I had something that was like completely not at all related to anything I do for work but I'm trying to learn to play the banjo. So, and this is pre-COVID even, just to, to try to do something. Before that, I was like taking ballet lessons and belly dance lessons at City in Motion. Just do something that is outside of your comfort zone and outside of your work that is completely different um, and, give, and protect that time. Make sure that you protect that time. Sorry, Melissa, yeah, go for it. Yeah, if protecting your time, I think, is um, always a challenge. And I think, like, the person who needs to know where you are when is your supervisor. And you need to make sure they, you are crystal clear with them on what your plan is. And if you're communicating that ahead of time with your supervisor, it's going to put you in a much better position. Um, like, I, during pandemic, when I had um, my baby at home with me, um, I had to block off times of my schedule where I was not working. Um, and our CFO would always call me during those times and I wouldn't answer. Um, so, and I tell my supervisor, Hey, by the way, he's, he's calling me. <laughs> he's calling me during my time. I'm not answering. Um, and he kept doing it, but I, I would never let go of that time and he always had to wait so it never helped him to call me during my off time um so i i think it's important for your supervisor to be able to be your champion and for you to be your champion Can you all hear me now? Okay, great. Sorry, my Zoom is so last minute, Eric. Yeah, what's your uh, tip for yourself for work life balance advice? Sure, yeah, the, those are, I completely agree with all that stuff on um, work life balance and, and setting boundaries and, and sticking to them. 
The other thing I would mention real quick is there's been a couple of questions on like mid career type stuff, and this would apply actually anytime. But um, you know, I I made a mid you know mid career change a few years ago to switching agencies, and before that, um, I, I would highly recommend that you just find someone in the organization or doing the job that you think you might want and talk to them candidly and informally. I had a really eye-opening experience with a, with a job that I thought I wanted. And I talked to a few people about it and decided I didn't want it. And I was really, really glad that I didn't just put in for a job and get it. Um, I was glad that beforehand I um, took some, somebody else's advice and went and just had some coffee with these folks and, and went out for a beer after work one day with some, with some other guys and just chatted about it. And was like, wow, I really don't want to do that. So I'm glad I found that out up front. So Informal conversations before you ever get to the application stage are hugely, hugely important. Right. And I'm a big believer that everything happens for a reason. So just take that for what it's, whatever it might be worth. So great. Well, we're one minute after one o'clock. So I want to be respectful of all your times and really appreciate you all being here. Um, students, like I said, we will post this, um, the recording on YouTube or send you the link. And we will also send you links to all of our panelists' LinkedIn pages, as well as their email addresses so you can connect with them afterwards. But I cannot thank them enough. This was so great. I even feel like I learned something. And so I'm very appreciative to hear about the different work you're all doing and just um, advice that you have, because um, there's never not time to get new advice, you know? So anyway, great. Thank you all so much. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. And yeah, we'll be in touch. Thank you.